And I'd like to start by acknowledging that long before Anglo settlement in the region of what is now the town of Clarkdale, Arizona, where I am located, the land upon which my office is found once was the homeland to the Hohokam people and today continues to be home to the Yavapai Apache Nation tribal members. Since 1991, I've worked in rural and tribal communities across the United States to promote community health, wellness, and economic development through provision of multimodal transportation planning, professional grant and technical writing, and uniquely customized training and technical assistance services with a special focus on transportation related program development and technical assistance for rural and tribal communities. My editor in chief, also known as my husband, was very intrigued with this idea of a meeting owl, perhaps overly so because he emailed me his device modifications. So when you look at the camera in the room, it doesn't look anything like this, but uh, my husband was trying to keep this interesting and exciting. So uh, this is his adaptation. And for anyone from a tribal nation, owls can sometimes be taboo. So we apologize for a technical version of one, but it is allowing us to broadcast much more widely and share our message with a lot of folks. So what if Noah built the ark today? And the Lord spoke to Noah and said, in six months, I'm going to make it rain until the whole earth is covered with water and all the evil people are destroyed. But I want to save a few good people and two of every living thing on the planet. I am ordering you to build an ark. And in a flash of lightning, he delivered the specifications for the ark. Okay, said Noah, trembling with fear and fumbling with the blueprints. Six months and it starts to rain, thundered the Lord you'd better have the ark completed or learn how to swim for a very long time. And six months passed, the skies began to cloud up and rain began to fall. The Lord saw that Noah was sitting in his front yard, weeping, and there was no ark. Noah, shouted the Lord, where is my ark? A lightning bolt crashed into the ground next to Noah. Lord, please forgive me, begged Noah. I did my best, but there were big problems. First, I had to get a building permit for the art construction project, and your plans didn't meet code. So I had to hire an engineer to redraw the plans. Then I got into a big fight over whether the ark needed a fire sprinkler system. My neighbors objected, claiming I was violating zoning by building the ark in my front yard. So I had to get a variance from the town planning department. Next, I struggled to obtain enough wood for the ark because there was a ban on cutting trees to save the spotted owl. I had to convince US Fish and Wildlife that I needed the wood to save the owls, but they wouldn't let me catch any owls, so no owls. Then the carpenters formed a union and went out on strike. I had to negotiate a settlement with the National Labor Relations Board before anyone would pick up a saw or hammer. Now we have 16 carpenters going on the boat, but still no owls. I started gathering up animals, but got sued by an animal rights group. They objected to me taking only two of every kind. Just when I got the suit dismissed, EPA notified me that I couldn't complete the ARC without filing an environmental impact statement on your proposed flood. They didn't take kindly to the idea that they had no jurisdiction of the, the conduct of a supreme being. Then the Army Corps of Engineers wanted a map of the proposed new floodplain. I sent them a globe. Right now, I'm still trying to resolve a complaint from the Equal Opportunity from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission over how many Croatians I'm supposed to hire. The IRS has seized all my assets, complaining I'm trying to avoid paying taxes by leaving the country. And I just got a notice from the state about owing some kind of use tax. I really don't think I can finish your ark for another five years, Noah wailed. The sky began to clear. The sun began to shine. A rainbow arced across the sky. Noah looked up and smiled. 
You mean you're not going to destroy the earth? Noah asked, hopefully. Wrong, thundered the Lord. But being the Lord of the universe has its advantages. I fully intend to smite the earth, but with something far worse than a flood. Something man invented himself. Government. So the purpose of our discussion today is to help you initiate capital projects, knowing that there are many regulations, rules and procedures, and that you can run into issues, uh, thankfully that Noah did not run into at the time, but um, knowing that there are many agencies and different organizations involved, many layers to this process, we wanted to start you off with this information uh, everything that I'm going to share here today is based on FTA guidance so that you can be in compliance uh, from the jump on these projects. So these two FTA guidance documents um, are things that you should get really familiar with. Yes, they are long. And if you cannot sleep at night, they are great reading. Uh, you get about 20 pages in and you want to nod off. So I just recommend that you read them specific to the chapter and the question that you have. But these are the links to the two documents. The one is Project and Construction Management Guidelines, uh, published in 2011. And trust me, even though it was published in 2011 and we have the bipartisan infrastructure law now, that doesn't change most of these regulations and whatnot. This other, the Construction Project Management Handbook, I've put a lot of screenshots and different things into this presentation and several different quotes from this document. And I will reference this, these documents later, but uh, when you receive this PowerPoint, you will have the links. And I highly recommend the use of these documents from the start of your project. So these are the topics that we're going to review today. We're gonna to talk about project initiation overview, and we're gonna do a just for fun cost pricing exercise. Uh, we will talk about project scoping and do a solicitation overview. And we will do an exercise about developing scopes of work. Uh, we will also uh, talk about your transit project successes and challenges. And we'll finish with uh, questions and answers. And so um, for those online, I'm uh, asking you to please um, put your name in the chat and your organization. And, uh, and then of course, any questions. And we're gonna to try to take questions at the end because we have quite a bit of material to cover. This is gonna be a 30,000 foot overview. Um, you know, I can't possibly teach you everything there is to know about building a transit facility today in 90 minutes and nobody should try to teach you in 90 minutes. Um, so uh, I will do my best to give you an overview of these couple of topics and to give you some hands-on practice in looking at some of these issues. So besides a command from God to complete a project, what are some of the other common reasons that a capital transit project might be initiated? So if you have any thoughts, go ahead and raise your hand uh, if you're in the room and or if you'd like to share or if you're online, uh, if you have any thoughts about why you might want to build a capital facility. Does anybody have any thoughts they want to share? Okay, well, there are a number of reasons that we might start to want to have a, a facility built. Um, and of course, we have various needs for our projects and those include um, administrative facility requirements and those facility requirements, you may need manager and administrative offices, dispatching and scheduling, document storage, conference rooms, computer and server space, uh, you may have maintenance and operations facility requirements, and those may be increasing. And so you may need to build or expand your facility to accommodate those things. So things like vehicle storage, possibly a wash bay, uh, vehicle maintenance bays, part storage, battery storage, a tire shop, tire storage, a break room for your drivers, training room, maintenance office, cash handling area, any of these kinds of needs that you so far don't feel like you're fulfilling 
or you find that your transit service is building at such a rate that you need to expand, these kinds of things may cause you to have a need to uh, do a transit project. And Bren Schweitzer has said, space needs, efficiency, current facility has exhausted its useful life. So thanks, Bren, for sharing that. Yes, those are all good reasons why you may be taking on a capital project. Okay. So this project initiation process requires a lot of decision making. Um, and so uh, transit programs often lack adequate um, vehicle parking, maintenance and administration facilities, and programs often kick off in whatever facility is uh, initially available. And so you just go with the facility that's available and you don't necessarily get to consider the space requirements or its functionality. And so in that case, you wanna have adequate facilities to maintain your vehicle fleet, provide quality service, offer passenger amenities, for example, bus shelters where the client, climate requires them. In the case here in Arizona, where it's so very hot, we can actually have misting in our bus shelters uh, to help keep people cool and to keep them from dehydrating. So this photo on the top left, this is Blackfeet Transit, and they actually operated out of an old gas station when they started. And that gas station and garage was inadequate either for their vehicle parking or for their maintenance or for their administrative facilities. So they found that they had a need to expand uh, their facilities. And this particular picture is uh, how the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians operated Cherokee Transit initially, just out of this modular building and had very poor area for vehicle parking. So you can see that, you know, we start with what we have access to and that may not be adequate. And as we expand, which we hope, of course, we're doing as transit programs, we're gonna need to do something different that's more site specific for our needs. So again, keeping in mind decisions, in the case of Gwich'isay Gwich'in tribal government, which is in Fort Yukon, Alaska, uh, in the interior of Alaska, I worked with them to do their safety plan many years ago, and um, they had started their transit service. Their transit service started to really expand, and because it gets to negative 40 degrees in the interior in this area that's just above the Arctic Circle, they needed to have a facility for their buses. And so they had an existing warehouse in town and they used tribal transportation program funds that were carryover from the prior year to renovate this warehouse facility. And it was a neat project because they actually uh, purchased a recycled, um, uh, a heating system that could recycle oil. And given the price of propane and whatnot in Alaska, that was a neat opportunity for them to keep fuel costs for heating the facility down in addition to getting this facility up and going. So planning, designing, programming, and implementing your transit capital project. And I'm just gonna go through all the steps from start to finish on the, these kinds of projects. So starting with analyzing your existing transit system. If you have no transit system, analyzing the transportation use system you have and doing some kinds of needs assessment to find out what transit needs are. And then evaluating alternatives regarding the design, the operational criteria, cost, benefits, impacts, plus all the preparation you're going to need to do of your NEPA documents. Next step, financial planning to identify the costs, the funding requirements, and those funding requirements can be your initial capital funding, your cash flow needs, and your ongoing operational expenses once you have this facility there is that going to change your heating needs? Is that going to change your internet costs? Is that going to change your, your phone costs um, and those sorts of things? And then also identifying what kind of funding sources are, you're using. Are they non-federal or federal? And are they going to be grant dollars? And then the next step may be reaching third party and regulatory agency agreements. So after these first four steps, then you're gonna look at what kind of project delivery approach are you going to use? And from there, doing things like a preliminary hazard analysis 
and a threat and vulnerability analysis so that your design criteria assures project safety and security before that final design is done and before you're doing construction and to ensure that neither the cost nor the community issues escalate during the later project phases. Further, you want to do a design that achieves the desired goals for what this facility is about, whether it's a bus stop or whether it's a maintenance facility or whether it's what some kind of a dispatch uh, building or whatnot. And you want to align those goals with all of this project design criteria, the environmental and financial constraints. From there, you move on to right-of-way acquisition. If you don't have right-of-way uh, access at this time and, and you need to, to either purchase some land or whatever, then this right-of-way acquisition becomes important. And then, of course, you start your construction in accordance with the plans and specs that you develop. And you want to do some testing and startup to ensure that the system is safe, secure, and meets your operational requirements. So you don't want that contractor to go off to the four winds before you've made sure that that facility is everything that you need it to be. And then you want to do consistent and continuous system performance monitoring to identify any requirements for additional improvements, maybe modernization or expansion into the future. And so that's kind of getting you started. And that's you know, the project initiation from starting point to end point. But one of the things that you want to think about doing that will lead you into your scope of work is this project requirements definition, this PRD. So in the PRD, the project manager refines and details the project authorization and details the goals in terms of the projects, the products and services that your project's going to deliver and the scope of work that needs to be done. And so this PRD is basically an authoritative reference for what your project's about. And then this acceptance of the PRD is a way that you guarantee that your entire agency is on board with a common understanding of this facility project uh, and between the uh, agency administration as well as the project manager on this construction project. So this is just a screenshot. I'm not going to go over everything that's on this slide, but this is straight out of that handbook that I showed you early on. And these are all the elements that should be in and inform your PRD. So agency, authorization, stakeholders, scope of work, uh, cost estimate, schedule milestones, uh, finance, risks, resources, constraints, and the acceptance criteria. And again, all this information and the various tables and whatnot that I share with you can be found in these, hand, in these handouts and these guidebooks. So choosing the right delivery method. So we have a multitude of alternative methods now that we utilize in construction. Um, and so this is just a list of some of those kinds of things. And then the most important thing is not just to consider the strategy for the project delivery method, but what are the risks and what are the potential costs of employing this particular uh, delivery method over others? And so as you consider which is the right delivery method that you're going to use, you need to consider both the costs and the risks. And this is a nice table that's found in the handbook that just summarizes very briefly from using your own forces for the total project and the construction to um, design, bid, build, construction manager at risk, design, build, design, build, operate and maintain or turnkey kinds of projects. And these, all these terms and things are defined further in these booklets and things, but also spelling out some of the advantages and risks of these different delivery methods for your project. Now, project management plans are something that's very advisable to do. Um, and if you um, are uh, developing a project and it's a smaller scale project, you may not have to do this per FDA regulation, 
but it is a good idea to do these because it helps you with your project. Because your project's manager is going to have to provide the project team with some kind of a roadmap on how you're going to get this project done. And the project management plan sets out how the project's to be managed, how it's to be executed, monitored, controlled, and then closed out through the entire pro process of the life cycle of your project. And then agency staff can plan, adjust their plan elements according to the project size, its complexity, and the phase of the project. But one thing to know is that federal laws require that any kind of major tran uh, transit capital investment projects, a million dollars or over, must have these project management plans approved formally by the FTA. So if you're writing these plans as a smaller scale project, then you don't have to share them necessarily with FTA. But if you're doing a large scale project that's a million dollars because you're a large transit system and you're building a very large scale facility, then yes, FTA is going to wanna to see that project management plan and give its formal approval. So here is just a list and chart again from that handbook of some of the typical engineering and construction project resource needs. So from management and control to planning and engineering and technical needs to construction and supply. This just gives a nice tight summary of all the kinds of things that you might encounter as needs for both the engineering side, uh, planning design side and construction of the project side. And so it's really important to assemble a winning project team. And this winning project team is, you know, you wanna carefully choose who that project manager is going to be on that project. And that that person is skilled and has done projects before and can be a good leader in this process. And whoever you decide as that project manager, that person is like God to Noah where we opened uh, with this session because that person's word is the authority on this project. And so the suggestions they make and the guidance they give are things that you really need to take to heart. And so the roles and procedures of everybody on the project team need to be well-defined regarding which project management staff are responsible for the project's management from delivering the project scope on time and on budget to uh, project staff that might be administering <clears throat> the project contracts and making sure, making sure that the contractors are meeting their obligations and protecting your agency or organization's legal rights and standing. So your project capability is actually a measurement of this team's experience, their skills and resources. And then further, the project's capacity is a measure of the quantity of the project's team's resources. And so it's good to have a contract management plan in place because then that can help you uh, with guiding how the project team operates and answering certain questions like, who has the authority to direct and approve the contractor to perform their work? And how is the contractor's work gonna be monitored and their performance reported and uh, the process by which change orders might be requested, God forbid, uh, and approved or any contract modifications that need to happen. And things like inspections and audits, who's, who's handling all that? And do they have the skills to do so? And so um, again, it goes back to the project manager and the team that you choose to assign to this project and that will help you with your success. So I would like to do this exercise with you. This is, there's a handout that you have that says just for fun, and it looks like this. And so this just for fun, price these items. So, and no smartphones and no Google allowed. This is you guesstimating these costs. And so, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, replacing a window with PVC double glaze, double hung under 101 United inches, that price by the each. So you can see on the right where I've given you, is this a price by the each? Is this a price by the square foot SF? Is this a price by the linear foot LF? 
is this uh, a price by the sheet, uh, a sheet of drywall, also known as gypsum, uh, or is it a price by the square foot? So take the next few minutes and fill this out, and then we'll talk about what you come up with. I'm sorry that we don't have tables to write on in the room, and I see somebody back there already looking all this stuff up on their smartphone. Maybe they're uh, texting. Misha, <laughs> Misha um, we actually didn't have that handout. Okay, well then moving so, on. Um, well, we can, is there any way we can do it um, together? Uh, well, I suppose we could try to do that. Um, so, okay, does anybody have an idea on this first line item? So it's 30 gallon, 30 gallon gas, actually, I put my screen, 30 gallon gas water heater replaced at the same location. Um, so anybody? raise your hands or put in the chat what you think that is. And again, it's just a guesstimate. And I just showed you the answer page. So you might have already well, seen it. It was too small anyways. <laughs> anybody okay. have a good student over here? <laughs> Mr. I raised his hand. $2,300 last week. Or four dollars Yeah, I think it was 2300 dollars last week for 40 gallons. Is he right? Okay. So uh, would you like the answers now or do you want me, because if I do the answers now, I'm going to have to flash back and forth between the two oh. screens, but I could, uh, let's go you through. Have an answer key by yourself? Like you have an answer key on the side? Or do you just want to go through the whole thing? What would you like to do, teacher? Well, I uh, we'll just go through the whole thing. And uh, Bren has said $2,500. So we'll go on through any of the other ones that anyone wants to take a stab Next, at. Remove a one square of fiberglass roofing shingle, tearing it off, uh, and one square is 100 square feet. So how many dollars per square? <laughs> oh, I know someone who didn't want to get tested. <laughs> okay, anybody? Oh, okay. You might win a gift card. <laughs> we have seven hundred dollars. I don't know who replaces a hundred square feet of anything. <laughs> he doesn't know who replaces a hundred square feet or a square foot of anything, though. Okay, well, maybe it's not as fun this way. Why don't we share the answers? And um, I'm sorry, yeah, we didn't have that one. Um, do we want to move on? So, all right. So here's the answers. And so before I go through some of these, what is the point of this exercise? Why are we talking about, about these costs? Because some of us have never bought or hung doors uh, and some of us never actually will. But what is, why do we start with this cost, these costs and thinking about prices? Anybody? It's a pre-pandemic price. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I developed these prices in September of last year using my construction project manager husband's suggestions of pricing. Uh, my husband works for the State Department of Corrections here in, in Arizona, so he does a lot of this work. Um, but, and of course, things may be different on the East Coast than they are out here. But, you know, we're talking about this because of the great escalation of prices with COVID-19, the challenge of getting supplies and materials, and the fact that one of the project initiation and project scoping kinds of things that's gonna help guide the development of your project and the scope of that project and any grants you write for that project is gonna be based on costs. And accord, if you build a facility, you probably don't need tubs around with fiberglass three paste with a soap dish, but you're gonna need paint, you're gonna need maybe exterior paint, you're gonna need maybe an electrical panel, if you have a lunchroom, maybe a kitchen cabinet, uh, every place is gonna need sheetrock, windows, doors hung. Um, and the thing that my husband was emphasizing was as of July last year, iron ductile iron pipe had just absolutely skyrocketed. So um, that's why we talk about these costs. But you can see for some of you that had some good guesses where you were at based on pricing that I got from my husband last fall. Um, and of course, the main point is you have to check all these prices to help develop your budget 
to know what this scope is going to be and what this project is going to look like and to make sure that your money goes as far as it can. And of course, you want to build into any construction project some contingency because of the fact that some of these prices can change and, um, and you may need some extra dollars to pay for things, especially since we've been in this time of COVID-19. So I already shared this slide um, and be aware when cost estimating. And this again is from last fall. Um, so this was on PBS NewsHour on Friday, October 15th. The average global price to ship a 40 foot container has more than tripled in, in a year's time to last October. So we can imagine even at this point where things have gotten to. Okay, so now we're gonna do the overview of scoping and solicitations and um, talk a little bit about project scoping. So the various design phases are intended to help develop and refine the project's requirements. And at the end of each phase, estimating and containing project costs is a key project management responsibility that begins at project scoping and continues throughout the design. And then one of the fu primary fu functions of project scoping is so that you can develop an accurate preliminary cost estimate of your project costs and compare it to the programmed cost. So when we talk about program cost, sorry for the noise on the water bottle, um, we're talking about what you may have written your grant for, for example. And so you want to try to project these costs as closely as you can, knowing that they may change and that we're in a difficult time with all that, but so that you can write your grant or make sure that the budget that you have will cover what it is you're trying to do. An effective way of containing project costs is to control that project scope during the initial scoping and then throughout that project design. And sitting down at your scheduled design review meetings and making sure you're still on track for that project scope. And so it's important that that scope of work is developed during project scoping. Uh, it's important that it's achievable with the budget that you have. So some important things to know about project scoping. Alternative analysis is used to identify potential concepts for project development analysis. Project development is the development of enough design to support the approval of the needed NEPA documents. And then engineering develops the project development design into that construction bid package, your solicitation, your RFP, and contains, which we hope that bid package, contains final drawings and specs. So following costs are things that you should be thinking about throughout this project. So agency project administration, topographical and boundary surveys, real property and right of way acquisition costs, geotechnical investigation costs, consultant support for design and construction, and cost estimation, value engineering costs, peer reviews, utility services to your site, the actual construction, construction inspection and management, and then any owner furnished equipment. So that is just some of the costs that you definitely need to consider as you're doing this project scoping. So we're gonna talk very briefly about procurement and solicitations. So starting with the request for proposals. That request for proposals comes out of the determination you've made of your needs. And then you can write that RFP. And then step two, is going to the solicitation stage where you're advertising this, you've marketed this, you've put it out on the ground, you've given a deadline for it, and you may or may not decide to conduct a pre-bid or a pre-proposal conference to give people more guidance so that you get the kinds of proposals that you're looking for. Step three is the evaluation of these proposals that you then receive. So ensuring that all the legal requirements are met and conducting your evaluation and making a selection. And the great thing about these FTA guidebooks is that they give you some tips and tricks for how to do your evaluation and scoring of proposals. And a lot of times it's a good idea to put into your proposals how you're going to do that scoring and evaluation so that the proposals you receive uh, reflect the kind of evaluation that you're going to do. 
So policies and procedures for obtaining professional construction or other services, right of way, materials and equipment should be established consistent with applicable government, in this case, FDA and agency regulations and the provisions of third party contracting guidance. Now here's another document that if you can't sleep at night, this is great for insomnia. Um, many pages long, probably 181 pages, but when you are writing grant applications to buy buses, so several years ago, I wrote and funded an FTA grant for Craig Tribal Association in Southeast Alaska on Craig, on Prince of Wales Island. And um, I consulted this third party contracting guidance to develop some ideology about how we're going to have to do the bid process for acquiring those buses. And so great document, very tight and to the point, not all that stimulating, but it has all the answers you need relevant to those points. Now, a procurement plan can help you with this part of the process. So if you prep a procurement plan for each phase to acquire all the required services and the items that you're gonna need in accordance with the mission and objectives of that particular construction phase, you're gonna be in a better position. And so the size and the content of each procurement package, your RFP, your RFQ, your RFI, your SOQ, whatever you're gonna call it, uh, that schedule for delivery and cost estimate, all those things should get included. And then specific requirements for procurement functions should be established in accordance with the suggested guidance and as documented in your source selection plan. So if you're a grantee, then they like to see these source selection plans. So in short, <laughs> procurement documents, procurement certification checklist, advertising. And then we go to pre-proposal and pre-bid conferences, contractor selection, pre-award survey, contract award, and monitoring control. That's your basic procurement plan. Then you go back and flush out what each of those things looks like relevant to your specific needs for your specific project and its design. So to learn a whole lot more from the mouth of the federal government, I highly recommend this great presentation that was done by Todd Brockman back in September of 2019 at the National Transportation in Indian Country Conference that we did last time we met in person in Big Sky, Montana uh, for that conference. Uh, Todd Brockman did this session, How to Hire and Manage a Consultant the art of writing a request for a proposal. And it's really a great document from the perspective of USDOT, but also some really great tips and tricks and things to think about when you're trying to develop this language, this legalese, and all the different things that need to be in a solicitation. So here's a bit.ly link to that uh, presentation and you can download it there. So next we're gonna do this scope of work exercise. And I do understand that I did manage to get the correct handouts to Liz for this activity. So you should have three handouts labeled handouts one, handout two, handout three. And these handouts should say solicitations, handout one solicitations, handout two solicitations, and handout three solicitations. So that handout one is a request for proposals for planning, engineering, and design for the tribal transit program. Handout two is an RFP for an environmental assessment for a transportation uh, office of uh, emergency services complex. And handout three is a call for proposals for a new admin building, justice center, and emergency operations center. Now you will see I've redacted these. Um, and you know it's a challenge when looking for short solicitations that I can use in an exercise like this, because when FTA has you doing solicitations for facilities projects, if any of you have written those, by the time you put all those FDA regulations in there, they can get quite long. So I've chosen some that are really short, and I want you to start by reading handout three, the one that is called for proposals with the nice border on the left side, um, and it's for an admin building, justice center, and emergency operations center. We'll read that, 
And then you get to choose whether you want to read handout one or handout two. And we will take the next uh, 10 minutes to read these. And then we're going to do a scope of work exercise. So does anyone have any questions? While you're doing that reading, I will try to get you these links here, but I'm going to leave this slide. So if nobody minds me leaving this slide, I will go back and put those links to that FHW PowerPoint and the construction manuals in the chat. So, Actually, it's not going to let me highlight that. OK, so Bren, if you need to see that PowerPoint right now, then go to nticc.org and go up to the right hand and click on archives and go to 2019's NTICC conference, and you can find this session listed there. Otherwise, we will be providing this PowerPoint. If I try to pull these links out of this PowerPoint in this moment right now, I'm going to have to go out to the internet to get them because I can't highlight them from my slides. So if folks can wait to get those links until we're done, uh, the links are available. Again, in the PowerPoint copy, we'll make available to you. And uh, you can email them to me. I can share them with the online participants. And this is Nellie. Hi, Nellie. I can't email them to you from where I'm at right now, but uh, we will make sure that everybody gets those links later on. And again, once everybody downloads the PDF, those links uh, are available to you. If you're on a Zoom screen with us today, you can click on those links right from your Zoom screen and go to any one of these websites. But I'm going to quit talking so people can read.
Tim, we're doing a little exercise instead of their readings. chance to fill out the sign-in sheet. Anybody not? Follow up with some additional materials. Okay, if you haven't finished reading, that's okay. We're gonna move on. And, um, and the kind of questions and discussion that we'll have from here, you don't have to have read in everything, but I wanted you to see a couple of different sample scopes of work. And I wanted you to see just in brief, 
how you can briefly put an RFP together um, and see some ideas, things that you might like, not like about said RFPs. But I wanted to share this because this details why these scopes of work uh, are so important. So here we have the building of a tree swing. And so the homeowner, the way the homeowner described it, this is how the tree ended up, the tree swing on that top left. And when the building department understood what the homeowner wanted, that second picture is what they thought it should look like. And when the rehab specialist got involved and designed it, that third picture in the top was what he designed. And the specs actually called for a tree swing that looked like the one on the top right. But the codes book and the performance manual required that it look like the tree on the bottom left. And then the contractor ended up building it, that second image that you see on the bottom, but of course, at the right there, the third picture from the right on the bottom is what the homeowner actually wanted. And so because they couldn't come to an agreement, the homeowner, the contractor, the rehab folks, the meeting, at the end of the meeting, they decided just to chop the darn tree down. So this is why it's so important that we write a scope of work that gets us to where we want to be. So you just looked at these handouts. And does anyone have any comments in particular about what you saw uh, in these solicitations? Because now we're going to write a scope of work and you can either write a scope of work for a tree swing or you can write a scope of work for a capital transit project that you'd like to do. So think if there's a capital transit project you'd like to do and take the next few minutes, we'll take about five minutes here to write a few sentences that are a basic scope of work. So if you wanna write it for the tree swing, that's fine. If you prefer to write the scope of work for the capital transit project, that's fine. And if you have any comments on these solicitations, uh, you can share those in the chat if you're online or raise your hand and I'd be happy to, uh, I think the group would be happy to hear any feedback you might have on these solicitations. So if nobody has any comments, then Please work on writing a scope of work. Again, I apologize that there are no tables to write on in this room. Uh, hopefully you have a notepad or something that you can brace um, yourself on um, and take a few minutes to either write a tree swing scope or write a brief scope for a transit project.
Okay, so I found a nice picture of a tree swing. Looks like a peaceful place to be on your tree swing. Does anyone have a scope of work they'd like to share? Anyone online or? Don't be shy. Some people writing, so. Okay. What were you guys writing? <laughs> I don't think we have any takers today, Michelle. I don't think so, and that's okay. Mostly I just wanted you to get the practice and get an idea, a feeling for you know what this takes and of course if you're writing for something like a facility project it's a little more complicated than a tree swing but you could see from the earlier diagrams i shared that you know if you communicate this incorrectly you might completely lose the tree okay so again our session sources are these two guidebooks the construction project management handbook published in february 2016 there's the link and the project and construction management guidelines. And there's the link. And Liz and Nellie put the uh, links in the chat for those online. And, uh, and anyone that's in the room here today can download the PowerPoint and access these links. All right, so um, I would like to hear from you for the next few minutes uh, about your transit project challenges and successes. So um, if you have anything you'd like to share, thinking about um, either an impediment that you've had to capital project development, especially project initiation, and or any challenges or successes that you've had with project scoping, um, or even just funding a project. Does anyone have any experiences they'd like to share? You're here for a reason. You must have some something going on. We've heard a lot about property acquisition being very challenging these days. Um, Bill, do you have any subrecipients who are having a lot of problems, or what are they facing in terms of um, construction projects? Yeah, you can talk from your perspective about the kinds of challenges that you regularly see with grantees. Just in general. Uh, It's really hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Maybe you can angle the mic a little differently. Is that better? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, at least with the, uh, from our 5311, we're all in our state. Uh, have a couple of transit construction projects going on. Certainly, the expertise in house to manage them is somewhat of a challenge, so we rely on outside consultant project managers at times to do some of that work. Just hoping you out of this session. It, it's still a little hard to hear you, Bill. You're kind of cutting out like every third word. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to hold it right this way. Sorry <laughs> <laughs> really about that. Uh, so, so it's challenging from a staffing perspective um, in our organization with uh, having the expertise and the training uh, to manage the projects. And I think that's probably one of our biggest challenges. Yeah, Misha, you talked about um, you know assembling that expert team. And I'm sure at a small agency, it's hard to, you don't really have a lot of people to pull from. So wondering how you um, suggest to agencies like that, how to handle that challenge. 
Well, you know, and I see this a lot because I work with tribal communities and rural communities predominantly. And yes, they do have small staffs. And so it can be very challenging um, and you may not have people with those skill sets. And this is where um, hiring a general contractor may make sense. And yes, there's all these different kinds of project delivery methods, but if you are, have limited staff, then that might be a real opportunity. And then, you know, basically you name somebody internally from your staff that manages the project, even if they don't have a lot of construction project management experience, um, you know, they can kind of guide the general contractor. Uh, maybe they wrote the grant, um, you know, maybe they are the transit administrator. Um, and so, you know, working in that way uh, and hiring a general can really solve a lot of the problems and get a lot of these ta things taken care of. Also, FTA can assign a project management oversight contractor. Uh, if you are a grantee, um, particularly if you're working on a large scale capital construction project, then FTA can assign you one of these individuals. And of course, the benefit of using one of these PMOCs is that they're very skilled in interfacing between you and between FTA and helping you uh, understand better what FTA is looking for in their grants and their requirements and the kinds of things that are needed at their level, but also helping FTA to understand what your limits are as, a, as an agency. Does anyone, does anyone else have any other comments or things that they'd like to share? And it can be, uh, you know, that you're working on certain grants, uh, that you have certain ideas that you'd like to bounce off the group, uh, a, a transit project idea you have. Um, if you tried to build a swing in your yard last year and it didn't work out, you know, share that project with us. Uh, Anybody want to share? Okay. Sure, please go uh, ahead. Hi, my name is Kathy. I'm from American Samoa, uh, transit manager. We are um, a grantee. So we have the privilege of working with our FTA APAs on out of Hawaii. Um, we are in the process of building our transit um, facility, maintenance facility slash uh, offices. Um, and um, we've gone to our NEPA. It's now, um, thank, uh, thank God for my um, architect, my Amy. So he's also our project manager. So um, now I will send him all of the other booklets, the resources there so that he can continue to make sure that um, our project uh, flows. So we're waiting to bid out the construction part of it, but yeah. Great, that's really exciting. When do you think it'll be on the ground? Do you know yet? Um, it's uh, with procurement right now, it should be up for advertisement, hopefully in the next two weeks. That time, yeah. Sounds good. Anybody else? Okay. Well, if you don't have anything else you'd like to share in that regard, then we can go on to Q&A. Um, I did want to leave you with this. Never be afraid to try something new. Remember, a lone amateur built the ark. A large group of professionals built the Titanic. <laughs> so are there questions? Anything that maybe Bill can answer because he's more local for some of you. I can talk more about the question that Liz posed. You know, we just heard how, you know, in, in certain cases you can use your architect um, and or the folks doing the design if they have the expertise to help with the management of your contract. And um, I wanted to share that we will be emailing out uh, to everyone that signed the sign-in sheet, uh, Seneca Nation's request for proposals, which is an on-call request. And so you can see what a solicitation looks like that has all the FTA uh, boxes checked, all the requirements. It's pretty long, it's 80 plus pages, 
but um, it has both a contract attached. And because it's looking for an on-call, uh, you know, to put a list of on-call providers together, it's pretty comprehensive in the sense of both the background on the project and the kinds of expertise they're looking for. And then it listed all the different things in the scope of work that might be possible things from bus stops to uh, facilities development um, to, uh, you know, acquisition of other you know, right of way and different things that might be needed for these projects. And so this is our RFP for architecture, engineering, and design. So if you don't have those staff uh, available to you because of the size of your program, again, you can hire a general contractor or you can look to some of the people that you're working with on the design um, for this project and or the engineering specs. Any other questions? Does anybody do online share? have any questions? Nisha, do you want to share what you're going to cover in the next session? Sure. Um, so in the next session, we're going to talk about grant writing. And rather than giving you a whole list of FTA grants that you can find online, I will provide you the links for those grants. And not all of them, because there's a lot of stuff out there now. Um, but my point in the next session is to help you find efficient ways to deal with the fire hose of funding that is coming at us right now. And so one of the challenges that I learned early on as a grant writer 30 plus years ago is um, how to manage my regular full-time job in addition to writing grants, because I found early on that I was either really great at writing grants or I was great at my 40 hour a week job, but I wasn't so great at doing both. And when I started this grant writing journey, I was actually teaching kindergartners at a Bureau of Indian Education school on the White Mountain Apache Indian Reservation. So I really wanted to be a good teacher and not be all hungover from staying up too late at night, uh, you know, having not slept because I was writing grants. So I developed some different systems and techniques and we're gonna write a project abstract and we're gonna talk about what goes into a project abstract. And I'm gonna give you some basics about how to do research because there's more money out there from foundations uh, in addition to the federal government and the state government dollars. And so when you're building a, a, a capital project, a facility, um, yeah, FTA will put all that together for you, but they won't help you buy the furniture that needs to go into that building. And so if you're by, uh, building a facility that passengers need to come in and sit down and wait for the bus, but FDA hasn't given you the money for benches and seats and chairs and all that kind of thing, then you know, I'm gonna share some tips and tricks for how to research those other funds. So I hope you'll come back. Um, I know we have a 15 minute break. Actually, it's gonna be more like uh, 25 minutes for you, unless there's other questions. And if anybody would prefer you know, I mean, I know people can be a little shy and wait till the room empties out and I'll stay on with you for the next few minutes till the end of this session. If anybody else has questions, um, feel free to ask them. I know this was, like I said, a 30,000 foot overview, um, you know, and we can try to talk about more specifics if you'd like. Um, and I just thank you all for coming out this afternoon and, uh, and doing the writing and doing the reading. And, um, Thanks for being here. And I wish I was in Erie. It's a lot cooler in Erie than it is in Arizona. And, uh, but as I said, I didn't want to share my germs with anybody. So thanks for thank Zoom. Thank you, Nisha, for being a trooper. And thank you for your presentation. And we look forward to the next one.